This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching Untold Stories, where twice a week together, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders to understand how this movement came to be, where we came from, where we are now, and where we're going in the future, and try to, like, connect and bridge all these different topics, Web3, Metaverse, Bitcoin, mining, NFTs, proof of work, proof of stake, uh, public traded companies, SPACs. There's all this lingo and people are throwing around all these different things, but we don't really know what they're doing or how they all kind of connect together. And then furthermore, I want to understand how I can trade that. I want to understand how I can make money for my friends and my family and grow this whole pie, this crypto pie. And today to talk about that, we have Matt Kalish. Matt, this is like the episodes that I'm most excited about. You're the president and, and co-founder of DraftKings. And not only is DraftKings, and we were just talking how DraftKings is, you guys have built the DraftKings marketplace, which is probably the first and one of the only full Turing complete, full complete product for NFT uh, uh, primary, secondary, secondary markets for everyone to kind of come together, but for everyone, like you built it for any single person, whether they understand crypto or NFTs or not, this is a ready to go sports fantasy NFT mystery box drops. You guys are doing from, from, from Tom Brady to Simone Biles. You guys are doing so many things. I don't know what I want to ask you first, whether it's like, like, like how, how DraftKings came to be or why the NFT marketplace came to be. But first, how's, how's your week going? Monday morning. It's Tuesday morning here. It's beautiful. Loving life, man. Everything is really good. Uh, right in the thick of the best part of the year at DraftKings, you know, NFL season about midway through NBA is kicking off. We have a lot of, uh, exciting stuff going on in the NFT space and our newest venture with DraftKings marketplace is really picking up steam. So really feeling good going into Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, holiday season coming up here. You're not just leading, leading that charge within the company and kind of like, uh, in this subset of the industry, but yourself, you're a huge fan of doing my research. Your board, eight yacht board, ape yacht club. NFT is your profile picture. So do you think that, that, that NFTs and essentially these kind of like very, very, um, close knit, tight knit communities uh, that exist around these NFT communities that you guys are all kind of like, uh, uh all have this common bond, do you think that these are like the precursor to the future of potential DAOs and things like that? I mean, you have bored apes, cool cats, but what's kind of happening here is you're having these communities uh, do things together. Uh, do you see any of that going on? Yeah, what I see is the very early stage of something that I think will be really exciting. You know, at DraftKings, we're our strategy is very audience centric. It's kind of our we start with our audience of we have over 10 million people in our database in the US uh, who are what we call skin in the game sports fans. It's people that you know, when you're watching football, you don't just want to sit there and watch. You want to predict things. You want to play. You want to compete with your friends. There's a lot of people like tens of millions of people out there like that. And we built up a large you know, audience over about 10 years of operating and what we found is that by following our audience and their interests and where their attention's going, that's been a pretty good way to build our product roadmap. So, you know, we started with fantasy sports, then we branched into sports betting, iGaming, and more recently, uh, DraftKings Marketplace. And when I say I think NFT and these, these communities are at a very early stage of something exciting, what I mean is... We know our audience are huge into uh, collectibles. We know that our audience are spending significant attention, you know, whether it's, you know, sports cards, whether it's, you know, stock trading, whether it's speculating on crypto or being an early adopter in a new space like digital collectibles. So uh, as I've just gotten to know our audience better, what I found quickly was, you know, there's millions and millions of people that you know, maybe not on day one, but over time, products like, you know, NBA Top Shots yeah. or some of these PFP avatar projects or gameplay uh, oriented NFTs, utility based NFTs, 
like these offerings are going to become, I believe, very popular, very mainstream. And we're really in that early stage where small communities are coming together and they're really kind of the thought leaders in their friend groups uh, or in their families. They're spreading the word and the word is spreading rapidly. So while I believe there'll be ups and downs and you know successful projects and projects that flop, the macro trend I see coming is, you know, high levels of adoption going into digital collectibles and basically all things NFT driven, whether that's gameplay, forms of utility or real life value, et cetera. I want to understand like what that future kind of looks like, but I want to understand really, I'm, I'm more curious, look like DraftKings, you guys are arguably the pioneer in modern day fantasy sports. Uh, I remember 2012, I was uh, in, in university and college and I was following very closely uh, the future of the business world. And you take note of businesses and companies that kind of steer the direction of, of humanity, all socioeconomic classes of everyone. Now you're kind of like solidified in that. What I, what I want to know and what like entrepreneurs, all of the listeners who are running their own businesses want to know is how do you listen to your audience? I mean, this is something that every business wish, wishes they could do on a day to day basis, because then you can operate the most successful company in the world. You know, your market, you know, your users, you know, you know, who's paying you. Uh, now here you are kind of re pioneering an industry that hasn't even entered the forest to trailblaze. This is so new. So how do you listen to your audience? Like what advice could you almost give to me and other people about that? Because you've been doing it so successfully. Yeah, that's kind of the origin of DraftKings to start with is this idea, like it kind of sucks to be a sports fan in the US 10 years ago if you're a skin in the game. I remember. If you like to play, you like to predict, you know, what could you even do 10 years ago? You were playing maybe season long fantasy on ESPN or Yahoo. Maybe you had an illegal offshore sports book or some bookie. Or you had some kind of like sports pool at your workplace where everybody put in $10. There wasn't a lot of options. And time after time after time, DraftKings, through just having a point of view that there's tens of millions of skin in the game, sports fans out there that want a deeper, better experience starting with sports. You know, that's what led to us developing this fantasy sports concept that then, you know, gained mass appeal and millions of users. And that's what let us extend our brand into products like sports betting and what let us extend our brand into iGaming and now into collectibles and NFTs. Just following that interest and where the attention's going. And I think DraftKings in a lot of ways is a case study of like what happens if you let like entrepreneurs, you let builders keep control of a company as it gets big and control the roadmap and really deliver a vision over a long term. Like DraftKings is still founder-led. All three, Jason, Paul, and I, we run the vast majority of the- Almost 10 years now, right? Yeah, 10 years in. Unbelievable. Yeah, we've raised a bunch of fundraising rounds. We've went public. You know, we've done a lot of growth, you know, but all of that has had one one sort of condition to it, which is we wanted it to be a founder-led, company where over the course of many years, we could realize our vision over the long term. And so still to this day, we control our roadmap, we control the investments that DraftKings is making. I think that's led us, you know, uh, kind of run this really interesting experiment, which is what if you let the entrepreneur, the builder keep building and like keep holding the ball, you know, it's not run by bankers, it's not run by private equity company, you know, DraftKings is still a founder-led business. So I think that's what let us be agile, what's let us take risks on extending the brand. And we've been right enough times to have credibility on that now. I call you a missionary founder. Missionary founders are ones who are, are you, you, you founded your product, your service, your business to change humanity, but also you're so mission-focused that your first incentive is not that money. So therefore, when it comes time to to points where other people can take over the company uh, because you're a missionary founder, you're mission focused. This is your incentive in life. Then then that trumps that. And it's a beautiful thing. I talk to economists, psychologists all the time, and everyone comes down to the same thing. There is something that actually uh, 
can can that something that makes us tick more than money. We always thought it was like money that fueled the world. It's not. There's something that changes, and it's this validation of a legacy. We don't want to be buried alone. We want to be with other people. Humans need to be with other humans. We want to love and we want to be loved and we want to have validation from the world. And it's something in our DNA. No one can really explain it. And that's kind of what missionary founders have. Ten years later, I'm sure there have been times when when other people you could have stepped back and other people could have taken over. I'm sure there are times that you're stressed out. I'm stressed out all the time. And here you are kind of like doing the next level of, of this whole NFT marketplace. It's really a great thing. How do you motivate kind of uh, all the people that work under you, you know, like every six months, I think an employee needs to be remotivated. How do you keep that going? Yeah, always a moving target in terms of, you know, how do you attract and retain the best talent? Yeah. But we have a couple of principles that are really important to us. First is, you know, we have this idea called act like an owner. You know, when we bring on any employee, one of the core things we measure is like, do they act like an owner? And we like to back that up by giving every single employee equity in the company and also, you know, significant upside based on the performance of the company. But everybody owns stock in DraftKings. We haven't hired any employees so cool. where that wasn't the case. And going back, if you're in that first cohort, you know, first couple of years in, some people, you know, had substantial, you know, equity holdings. So when we went public, you know, due to the success of the company, we had dozens of people who became millionaires off of of, you know, DraftKings going public. And they put in that five, six, seven years and really, you know, formed initiatives and ran forward some of our most important programs that made us what we are now. Uh, I think Jason, Paul, and I as founders, like what we always thought was, you know, be willing to give up ownership in the company to get people invested in what we're doing and increase the success rate, increase our probability of building something very large, you know. So that was always our goal. And I think where maybe some companies do it differently is like a little bit more resistance to giving up ownership, giving equity, too focused on maybe like what percent of the company do I own versus like how big is the company? Yeah. I would much rather own one or 2% of a very large successful company than own 90% of something that nobody cares about. And that's something that was always really important to us. That, yeah, having... Owning now one, you know, I own some companies like lower percentage of bigger companies and then bigger percentages of stupid companies. So I definitely like the former over the latter for sure. I mean, like, uh, it's kind of fun talking about these, these such macro topics. But then at the end of the day, I can ask you something like, why do you like the Board Ape Yacht Club? Like, why that one over something else? Yeah, I have, you know, the good thing about the blockchain is everybody sees all of my you know, transactions. I've doxed all of my crypto accounts and, you know, happy to share everything I Same. buy, sell, the wins and the losses. And I've had both, you know, for sure. Um, Board Ape Yacht Club, I think have, if not the best team, maybe like a top two or three team of anyone who's launched any sort of like, you know, utility PFP style project in the last year. Um, my personal opinion is like they've proven more than any other team has. Yeah. Um, maybe you could argue like Art Blocks with Snowfro have proven a lot. You know, so there's a few a few really successful projects out there. But what's different about Board Apes is I think that they've really transcended. You know, this idea of like crypto native, kind of like us sitting around. Uh, we could have probably like a really technical almost dorky conversation about crypto, but what Board Apes has done is transcended culture more than any other product. So you see, you know, NBA players, rappers, you know, entrepreneurs, a huge swath of highly culturally relevant figures jumping in and supporting Board Apes Yacht Club publicly. And so I think that the image around that project stands out more than anything else. And I could see them taking the ball much further, you know, from where it is now. Like they, they're just sort of getting started. I saw like yesterday, Post Malone was public. He had two board apes. Jimmy Fallon was in the news. Ty Halliburton is wearing like wow. board ape yacht club sneakers in an NBA game, you know, and posting a lot. So I think we're really just getting started, but it's it's a project that I think has the biggest lead 
in terms of like mainstream culture relevance right now. As these teams get kind of more, uh, uh, as these different projects and teams start to get more, have more like loyalty to their holders because they start, there's more, you know, interaction back and forth. Uh, I think you could potentially see voting blocks. And I'm talking about the precursor to DAOs running smart cities. This is the test. This, these are the tests. The world is watching how these communicate, how these communities navigate each other, interact with each other, how they're valued, how price discovery is done. All these questions, no one really understands. You know, that's why they're listening to the show. They're watching you very closely. Uh, and I think the, there's a there's a few questions that I'm always asked. Uh, sports teams and NFTs. This seems like this was the breakthrough of where how NFTs will hit mainstream adoption. Uh, sports. I really want to understand why you probably consult with like I, I've recommended Chili's tokens, which allows people to allows sports teams and everything to 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 go public or whatever. Um, still a lot of, you know, a lot of things to understand. Do you ever get calls from like, you know, how do you get a call from Mark Cuban? You get some, you know, these teams, the owner calls you of Dallas Cowboys and says, hey, explain this NFT world to us and how we can kind of benefit from that. What's the answer? Is it fan loyalty? Is it revenue stream? Is it this is a free thing? What kind of angle? Uh, I think where a lot of people get tripped up is, well, two places, really. One is like starting to micro, e.g. Okay. like trying to figure out like, well, what could I sell? How ma- how much would it be per thing? Whatever. You know, uh, they see like a couple of successful projects and they're trying to immediately jump to the business side without really like understanding the culture. And then I think the other thing um, that you can get tripped up into is like short term versus long term just like looking for immediate gratification versus building something that's like interesting over multiple years. Like what, what, uh, in personal career wise, like I kind of went through this journey of, I started in analytics, doing numbers. I played poker. I was trying to like perfectly evaluate every yeah. hand cal- using calculations. And, but over time, the thinking like to do, to do something relevant, like I think becomes much more macro. So Everyone's all over the place on what, you know, NFTs over the last years mean long term for their business or their league or their, you know, personality or whatever. Everyone's trying to figure out what it means for them. And I feel like the most kind of uh, like interesting discussions I've had or the most uh, successful people over the last year have been they kind of start with the, the, the culture. They start with like the vision and then they try to make plays that are more into the macro trend. Versus like, ah. what can I do right now to make, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars? You know what I mean? So right now I see a lot of like, you'll see, you'll see uh, signed or collectible or limited editions be, be sold for, for like a low dollar amount. But a lot of times uh, these teams, you know, working with you guys will give away free NFTs. And I had a, a guest on the show and he said, that's the move. He said, at some point, we're going to be competing for everyone's wallet. So you want to get your NFT in as many wallets as possible. It's a numbers play, not like, oh, I'm trying to create price discovery and value on day one. Yeah, like my my thought on most digital collectibles, there are some projects that have pretty hard physical real life value. I'd say like V Friends, where sure. you know you could look at it and say, okay, I can calculate that I'm getting a conference. Uh, admission ticket or I'm getting, you know, um, you know, uh, gifts every six, uh, every six weeks for three years or whatever. Right. So you can do math on it, but most things are what I would consider just like personal identity. You know, people are buying things that they want in their wallet and it's a public wallet on the blockchain and they want it for clout or they want it to build out a side of their identity that they feel like they want to show off to the world. Hmm. Like the same reason I'm collecting, you know, flesh and blood cards behind me, this, uh, this, uh, card game that I like, or, uh, Tom Brady rookies or different sports cards. The same reason I have the art in my house. I have, you know, the same reason I collect the things I do on, on open sea, like they're all just part of my identity. So I go on Twitter and I'm people have an idea of what I like or what's important to me. 
And I feel like the the top thing is how do you build a product that like people actually want that connect with them in some way? Because you know you can give things away for free all day. You can yeah. you know um, try things, but if it doesn't build like a real connection, if it's not something that like a decent sized audience want associated with their identity, then it's just going to fail. I think in the end. So you're saying that the that these audiences want something associated with their identity rather than like making them some money. Yeah. That's the that's where the real business is. Like if you think about sports cards, why do people collect sports cards? Like how how many people are collecting them to make money? It's like very few. You know, and people have weird behaviors with sports cards. They're not like I want to collect every single athlete equally. You know, when I was growing up, I wanted every yeah. Charles Berkeley. You know, I wanted to collect Barkley. I had a friend who was like Ken Griffey Jr. You know, people have affinity towards certain types yeah. of content. Oh, so you're saying that I'm asking the wrong question in that why are people, the question shouldn't be why are people using NFTs as collectibles? The question is why are already people who are, who already collect things like collectibles or are involved in this some way, why are they in love with NFTs over the traditional way of doing it? And the traditional collectibles market had no price discovery, had no ability for people to transact with each other. You'd have to go to your local like baseball card store. Like that industry before NFTs arguably was very archaic, right? Yeah, look, I mean, there's two very different, like think of the person who is an early adopter of NFT projects and in their friend circle. Now they're the center of attention. Everyone's asking them a million questions yeah. about like how it works, whatever. Then over here is the other person who is like, why can't I just right click and save this JPEG and put it on my computer for free? I don't understand. You know, like th those are two different brands. These two people are very different people. Right. And I think the, the personal identity, the brand around someone who's like an early adopter who understands, like, I see where this is going from a big picture macro standpoint. And I'm going to put that point of view out there to my friends. And like when that. I'm right, two years from now, everyone's going to think that I'm like this guru for seeing the future. And the other person is sort of like foot in mouth six months from now when they realize like, oh, this is actually a cool emerging technology. Like, those are different different brands right and so i think a lot of what anyone does with collectibles is like identity brand like that's why you collect art that's why certain pieces of art connect with you you know certain collectibles connect with you you want them sort of appended on to who you are sorry to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming but i wanted to tell you guys that if you're using pancake swap uniswap dydx sushi swap you're doing it wrong you need to be using paraswap because paraswap is a user interface, a decentralized smart contract platform that sits on top of all of these. And when you go to Paraswap or untoldstories.link forward slash Paraswap, because they're refunding your gas, if you go there, then you'll be able to, on top of Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and Polygon, look for the best prices for your tokens and swap and do everything in one predefined transaction on chain instead of having to do the approval to this token to that token to do all these different things paraswap does it all for you it's decentralized they just released their api version 5 that you can see everything it's all open source very cool stuff untoldstories.link forward slash paraswap if you're using any of the other decentralized protocols you're doing it wrong because you need to be using the routing beautiful paraswap routing system and it's fully decentralized too it's gorgeous. I'll talk to you guys soon. The NFT industry now can be broken up into multiple. You have the collectibles and you have sports and you have things like I, I play online. I play, I watch horse racing where I have my own NFT horse and I breed a Zed run yeah, and I breed the run. horse. It's great. Um, I never thought about that quote. You said title the episode, that quote, It you know, about how, how uh, I already forgot already forgot the quote about collectibles or whatever, but we'll bring it back after. Um, because I was really thinking about when I was younger, um, I was given a gift, a Roberto Clemente in action card from like 1976. And I was never a, a card collector before then, 
But because I was given that gift, I wanted to own, like you said, I wanted to own all of a sudden, like every inaction card that was made during that year. I just wanted to like have my niche of collecting because that was part of, that was my identity. And so now we're moving towards this digital world, but well, we are in this digital world with everything, digital payments, web 3.0 and non-fungible tokens, what we know them as NFTs will be the de facto part of our digital identity. It is what people will look at us when we want to express ourselves. It used to be with Facebook and Twitter and, and likes and things like that. But this is the next level. This is the Web3. It, 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 bringing it all together is just so awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a really incredible emerging space for sure. Tell, tell me about the, the DraftKings marketplace and why, like how you've created this kind of like turnkey, full, complete everything uh, from the drops to the secondary market to the interactions with everything together. You don't, you don't leave anything where the user has to go anywhere else. They can do it all from within. We have one of the most important, you know, aspects of any marketplace, which is we have a really large audience, uh, and our audience is already engaged very highly. You know, we have people playing every single day. They come on, whether it's sports betting, fantasy, they're on the platform, and we have millions of those people, and they have funded accounts. Like, they have a, an account balance on DraftKings. They have credit cards on file. Yeah. So a lot of that friction of like getting started with a marketplace and doing that at large scale, that's our advantage, right? Like if you think about how difficult it would be for somebody to step in and compete with like eBay, you know, eBay has millions of users. It would be tough to compete with yeah. eBay, you know, in creating a marketplace. And I think that there's sort of like this benefit that we have from just already having an at scale audience of the right sort of, you know, consumer to build a marketplace like this. So then we went in with the perspective of, well, where is that audience right now in the crypto native kind of like learning curve? And our perspective is that's coming quickly, like very quickly, but right now there's still a lot of people more comfortable with Fiat payment, right? And if you look at products like NBA Top Shot, I think it would be a good testament, like even leaving DraftKings out of it how many people were able to jump on and sure. open packs on NBA Top Shot paying $9 versus how many people are doing, you know, uh, crypto first, Ethereum, you know, minting and things like that or buying on OpenSea. You know, much more comfort today from like a mass market standpoint with Fiat. So what we led with was you can use your account, you can use the money you have in your account already to transact in DraftKings Marketplace, you basically don't have to do anything, right? You just look at the drops. If you want to buy them, you can. Uh, you can use the existing balance, the existing account you already have. So that was our entry point. And we launched with one partner called Autograph. And Autograph is this NFT company that uh, Tom Brady and Rich Rosenblatt are the two co-chairs of, uh, CEOs Dylan Rosenblatt. They have some incredible, you know, name, image, likeness rights around a lot of the favorite athletes of DraftKings uh, uh, players, like Tom Brady, Simone Biles, Usain Bolt, Wayne Gretzky, you know, like icons of sport. And going back to like, why do people collect things? You know, these athletes have tremendous followings. So what we saw out of the gate was, you know, this is a good mainstream way to, to bring to market collectibles that have mass appeal that people genuinely want in their collections they want to hold. I never realized how how much sports is a part of our identity as human beings until this this podcast. Uh going back from 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 the Olympics in in Greece, you know, in the old Greek Olympics to now uh even how the Romans had sport and things like that. I never realized how much it was a part of everyone's identity. I think, Matt, until until sports were canceled during COVID for that first year. Because you'd look, you'd be at the barbershop looking on TV, and that constant that's been part of your life since the day you were born was not there. Yeah. It was a really scary thing. Yeah. What yeah. what is it about about sports and our interaction with sports and and this whole 
Like, what is it about it? Have you ever sat and thought about this question that makes that is such a part of like our our hearts or pillars of our lives? Um, lots of things. I mean, I think the number one thing about sports that like really connect with us is that there's like a real concrete scoreboard and winners and losers. Like there is always perfect resolution to sports. So many Ooh. things in life don't have perfect resolution. Like, am I successful? Am I a good friend? Am I like a good son? Am I doing enough to help my community? My Whatever. good husband. Like, yeah. Yeah. Sports, you always know kind of like what happened. Maybe it's totally fair. Maybe you feel like you got, you know, a bad call from a ref or something. But at the end of the day, there's a winner. There's a score. There's a champion at the end of the season. Then you run it back. And everyone's constantly trying to improve. And so I think there's something about like the finality of like, you always know the outcome and you can root for your team on a journey and be a part of something that makes sports really special. And yeah, I think that relate to collectibles a lot because, you know, I'm a, I'm like a Celtics fan. I have season tickets to the Celtics. I go to every game I can. I'm never selling. If I have like a Jalen Brown rookie or a, a Tatum or, um, you know, even Al Horford now that he's back or Schroeder, you know, I'm never selling their stuff. Right. But if somebody gave me like a Kevin Durant, I'm like, I don't really care. I'll sell Kevin Durant. Like I'll sell his rookie card because I don't have a connection to that card. And he's I a know big listener of the do. show, by the way. I'm just letting you know. No, I'm joking. He's not. <laughs> no, maybe because I don't know. I like Kevin Durant, like nice, <laughs> nice guy, but I don't have a real genuine connection to yeah, him because course. he's not on my team. And I know somebody else, he is on their team and they're going to put a high premium on that. So I think that's kind of a lot of the secondary transacting in collectibles is like migration of stuff to people with very high affinity for it and pushing away things that you have low affinity for. That's a lot of what the secondary market is. I always, that's, that was really kind of my next question is I, is I don't, you know, I, I think we're starting to understand why the, how, the, what, you know, getting that collectible or, or playing card or, 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 or horse that you can breed or a piece of artwork that I was, that I saw, my wife saw the other day, she wanted to buy that we were at a, at an event and they were selling the NFT versions of this digital, beautiful artwork. I understand all of that now. And once it's in my wallet, you have this secondary market with like, price discovery. And I don't know how it works because how do you figure that out? How does the mechanism work to figure out that you hold less value to that Kevin one where someone else, where he's on a different team may hold that in higher value? How do, how do you guys figure that out between each other? Or is that something that kind of happens offline? Like the relative value? I mean, yeah, it's like auctions and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, early, we're in an early stage, this so I think crazy, just yeah. collecting basic insight into like how different things are valued is still, you know, there's a, probably like a lot of volatility right now, it's just not as hammered out. Um, but yeah, I think like just test and learn big part of our culture, you know, you do some drops, you try to understand like how those are being received and, you know, you make the appropriate adjustments, whether it's like more or less like interest than we thought is make the adjustments over time to just try to get it right. Hollywood TV and film is America's largest export. Like we just the amount of content that we put out for the globe is just immense. Uh, I thought that the NFT world would would be a lot more integrated in that kind of industry, uh, not sports first. Why am I wrong? But really, because and the sub side question is, I, in my other life, I'm a film producer, too. So I kind of want to understand how because I'm being asked by studios all the time, like, what do we do? I have I have studios that own all these IP catalogs of, of movies going back, you know, dozens of years and they don't really know what to do. No one really knows what to do in that industry. Yeah, it's probably a combination of like early stage trying to navigate some really complex like macro IP. stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's like, I think, start with the macro vision of like, is there demand for, you know, movie, music, like yeah. this sort of product? Yes. And then it gets down into the to the levels of these companies and everyone's getting all tangled up in, well, how does IP work? What is the like yeah. copyright? What are my distribution rights? Like, what can or can't I do? And 
the complexity, I think it seizes up a lot of like what seems from a big picture, like a really obvious play. Yeah, it seems like it seems like the the hang up is there's no line between collectible and security, because if you're issuing if like Disney issues a Lion King NFT, I don't know if they could. They have to figure out if they had the rights to do that first. But if they did, where would it go from being like collectible to where saying it's like, oh, if I buy this now, Disney has more money to make the next Lion King movie. And I want to have a piece of that. And owning this collectible may have a a stake in the, maybe the value of this thing goes up and anyone who's, who's involved in securities will tell you, well, I'm not a securities lawyer by any, anything. I'm not any lawyer, but if like someone, from what I understand, if someone believes in future value of what you're selling, then there's a potential for security. So I think that also is where kind of like the line is too the, 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 the gray area. Yeah. So. Let's be like really clear on this. That's not where, what the business is. And that's not the future of the business either. In my opinion. Good. Yeah. If you're somebody like, and there are people out there like this. If you're somebody whose mindset is like, I can buy and flip and sell things and sort of arbitrage. You're a, like a sole proprietor. You're on your own, right? You can't go into it expecting that some, some external force is going to support you in trying to like find an arbitrage or find a disjoint in the market where you can flip things for more, or sell them for more. You're, you're speculating. You're an individual kind of, I view it as like a sole venture of if you want to try that and people are trying that you're solely responsible for those like successes or failures. And like, I think that's where a lot of people get hung up is they're like, buy something and then have a very unrealistic expectation that like some outside force is going to do X, Y, and Z things to make their, the thing they bought more valuable. And that's not what the business is, right? That's somebody who's doing something that's kind of like a side, uh, side. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one like of the a, most brilliant things that I've heard because that's why people have been getting wrecked in crypto since 2010 for that specific reason. Uh, if you're investing in something, you're expecting like that arbitrage or quick flip. So rather than doing that, it's like, fall, so your so your advice would be to someone like fall in love with a community that you already love and understand or like a collectible that you've already like kind of look inside yourself first and see what, how you can get involved in these communities. By, my thought is buy things you like that you want part of your identity that you intend to, to hold treat this mark treat this as collectibles you know there's no in my view there's no business around this idea that you can buy something and it will go up in value over time that's not a business like it's yeah. i think a lot of unrealistic expectations have been formed over the last year yeah because people hear stories so they're like okay somebody minted board apes for 0.08 eth and then they sold it for 50 eth or they got a good one and they sold it for 400 ETH and made millions of dollars. And like those stories, I think have somewhat created unrealistic expectations that cannot possibly exist. Those conditions can't exist in the future, right? They're not going to, that was a very short term moment, right? So the way that I'm viewing this is, very similar to how I would view art, how I'd view trading cards, any sort of collectible that you want associated with your identity. The same reason you buy the car that you buy because you like the car or that you decorate your house a certain way because you want that to be like the aesthetic that you're around. You know, anything that builds your identity, uh, I would recommend collecting with the intention of like holding it because that's part of you. This whole other side of the world, I think, is going to go away very rapidly. I don't see that being something that sustains for long. Typically, the people that are like these sole proprietors trying yeah. to find arbitrages and disjoints, that doesn't last. It never lasts. And it's not like a sustainable business. You've given us uh, a lot of things to think about here. And at the same time, that insight is probably one of the best insights that someone could really get understanding that that nft world because like you said that we're hearing so many stories it's like 
the NFT world is you're hearing the stories of like, you know, by the entrance of the casino is the slot machine that's fine tuned to have higher payouts. You're seeing the shiny lights on the big news stories of someone winning, you know, making $50 million on a quick flip. But that's not that's the one off. You got to come to untold stories to hear the stories that are untold where it's not the one offs. You're getting the information that you just gave us. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate you coming on the show today and, and talking about this, uh, uh, giving us a very good understanding, a masterclass on really NFTs and where they're going, uh, DraftKings and why you guys are supporting all those communities and why you like what you like and why we should all continue investing ourselves and invest in what we like. Yeah, you're never unhappy with something if you bought, if you bought it because you like it. Like, do you think Post Malone cares if his board ape, what he paid for it, if it goes up, if it goes down? He doesn't care. It's like, that's brand. He's building his brand. He's like basically saying to the world, I get it. I understand this technology. I understand the culture around it. It's disruptive. It's innovative. It's cool. The vibes are like immaculate on social. I want to be a part of that. I want to like hug in this world that's emerging. What do you, that's what everyone's doing. That's what Snoop Dogg is doing. That's what Jimmy Fallon is doing. They're siphoning this like social clout and the, the sort of culture around a really exciting, innovative space. This isn't like, I hope it goes up in value. That's not what they're doing. And that's what they're doing is what the end state is. I truly believe. I think that's where very quickly we will end up with this space. Wow. Thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories today. And I'll talk to you in a little bit. All right. Take care.